Hello everyone, my name is José Carlos Martins da Rosa, I'm from Brazil, and today I'm going to present a new surgical technique developed by me and my team six years ago to broaden the indications for immediate loading on individual teeth. I hope you enjoy. This new technique is called Immediate Dentovelar Restoration, or IDR, Immediate Load Implants in Compromised Alveolar Sockets. With this technique, tissue losses with varied extensions are reconstructed in the same surgical session of implant placement and provisional crown installation, reducing the number of interventions and keeping predictability on aesthetic aspects. Let's understand which are the basic principles of this technique and the surgical and prosthetic protocol developed by us. Imagine if a patient had an accident and she has to remove the left central incisor. Let's begin by thinking about how to answer these questions. What would you do if all walls around the tooth are present or if she lost one or all bone walls? What is the importance of this treatment for this patient? Is there a predictable treatment? Is it possible to predict the result, better yet, the maintenance of gingival margin and papillae at the same position? We can face two, these two possibilities. Intact socket, when all walls around the tooth are present, or compromised socket, is missing some wall, and normally the buccal bone wall is lost, like in this case. In both situations, we can't foresee any result. I think you agree with me, but what can we do especially in compromised sockets? This is our main subject, how we manage this kind of problem. IDR or immediate dental velar restoration is a technique that we use in compromised sockets and it means immediate sock reconstruction soon after minimally invasive dental extraction, correct three-dimensional positioning of the implant and construction of the temporary crown with proper emergence profile in a single procedure. Here we have a case that we apply this technique before and three years later. I'll present the IDR protocol that takes in 15 steps and I will show you all the steps. To explain better, I choose a special and very interesting clinical case. As you can see, the gingival architecture is showing changes in the level of the gingival margin in the region of the two central incisors. This patient came to us because she had an accident and fractured the right central incisor and she lost all buccal bone wall. We can see here a swelling of the soft tissues. Let's follow the technique step by step. Firstly, careful assessment of the bone defect previous to extraction, clinically, radiographically and through CT scans. Clinically, we can notice the presence of an abscess and unleveling of the gingival margin. By X-ray, we can show you the tooth to be extracted and we can notice the presence of fracture. And through soft tissue CT scan, we can see all absence of the buccal bone wall. A total absence of the buccal bone wall was confirmed using a periodontal probe. We have here around 10 millimeters in depth. It's very important to evaluate the periodontal biotype and we use the contralateral tooth to access the periodontal biotype. In this case, the left central incisor showed thin buccal cortical bone and thin soft tissue. Therefore, we evaluate as a biotype type 4. 
And this kind of biotype is the most difficult to work due to the thin thickness. But evaluating the right centering sizer through CBCT imaging, we can clearly see an increase of soft tissue volume caused by the abscess. The second step is minimally invasive dental extraction using microsurgical blade, peritone, microlever, and atraumatic forceps applying smooth movements, preserving the integrity of remaining bone walls. As this tooth was completely fractured, we remove carefully in small pieces, avoiding traumatizing the soft tissues. Here we have all pieces of the tooth removed. The next step is careful curettage of the socket to remove the granulation tissue and the remains of the periodontal connective tissue. Be careful during this procedure not to traumatize the gingival tissue, neither the gingival margin nor papillae, especially because we are touching in a very thin soft tissue. I'll suggest you to give a plenty of irrigation with saline solution to clean the socket as much as possible. After tooth removal, we can measure the diameter of the implant according to the diameter of the socket opening. Here we have 7 mm of the socket opening and we are expecting to leave 3 mm of the gap between the implant and the soft tissue. This is why we will select a regular platform of the implant for this case. At this time, we can measure the thickness of the gingival tissue to compare it to a new measurement in three months time. We can see here around half millimeters thick. The following step is probe of the socket walls to assess the extent of the bone damage. We will assess the defect in height and width. We can confirm here a total absence of the buccal bone wall. The next step is the preparation of the bone site with a palatal wall approach. As you can follow through this illustration. To do this, we have to introduce the first drill from buccal to palatal aspect using angulation of 45 degrees and soon after to deepen approximately 3 millimeters, we can change the axis of palatal inclination of the drill. After that, we could introduce the other drills in accordance with the planned length. In this case, we will insert an implant of 16 millimeters in length. After total preparation of the bone site with the palatal wall approach, we insert the implant with optimal apical stability. And with a biological distance between 2 and 3 millimeters from the implant platform to the gingival margin. At this moment, we check it through X-ray the adjustment of the temporary abutment onto the implant. We always select the diameter of the implant is smaller than the socket opening expecting a wider gap to get a thicker buccal bone wall after reconstruction. To do so, we have to leave at least 3 mm gap wide. A customized profile is directly related to the tissue maturation. The final shape of the gingiva is given by the provisional crown shape. For this reason, 
we must customize the emergence profile of the temporary ground. We insert the temporary abutment over the implant. We remove this abutment and we adjust the abutment length according to the occlusion. Now, we were checking the prefabricated acrylic resin tooth related to the form, color and contours. The small layer of composite resin is applied over the abutment and the veneer is positioned. We are using now light curing. We can apply composite in the palatal aspect. At this moment, we have to do the occlusion adjustments, relieve this tooth from the occlusion. We remove the provisional crown from the patient's mouth and we fill the cervical part of the crown with composite resin in increments. We start to do the first finishing. We can do it with diamond burrs or serpal rubber wheel. Afterwards, we insert the provisional crown onto the implant. And we did the mark using a pencil at the level of the gingival margin. And after that, we remove the provisional crown from the mouth. And we start to do a concave shape. And after that, we should do the finishing and polishing of the provisional using a polisher kit, as you can observe. The design is performed in the cervical portion of the provisional crown, a concave shape, to allow a better accommodation of soft tissue. Then, after finishing and polishing, we check the provisional crown onto the implant, and we check the relation between the cervical part of the provisional crown and the gingival margin. It's very important that the provisional crown can't pressure the soft tissue. Before you start the bone reconstruction, we must insert the cover screw over the implant to avoid the possibility to get some residual bone inside the implant. We have to map the defect on the apical coronal and mesodistal aspects with a periodontal probe. We have to measure the defect in height and width. But we can do a simulation of the affected area to transfer the internal probe values to the external gingival aspects. We use the blood clot from the sockets to do it. But why we do it? To know what is the extension of the bone graft and how is the shape of the bone defect under the soft tissue. And here we have the final graft dimensions according to the shape of the defect size. I'll show you what instruments can be used to harvest graft from tuberosity. We use chisels, straight or gauze-shaped. And chisels have to be millimetered to remove the graft safely, regarding the amount of the bone to be removed and not touching in areas such as dental root or the maxillary sinus. And chisels width must be 2 mm larger than the graft to be removed. The chisel selection is made in according to the defect type, the bone volume to be removed and access to the donor site. Here we have the IDR kit. This is the kit that we help in development. Inside the kit, we have six chisels, six, eight, and 10 millimeters wide. Three of them are straight and three of them are gauze shaped. We have inside the kit a bone compactor, 
used to pack the graft and the recipient to insert the graft. The kit got the name of the technique. It's called IDR kit. We have to hammer the chisels carefully. The next step is harvesting of bone graft from tuberosity. To do this, we need previously a clinical assessment and CBCT image from the tuberosity to assess the bone availability and to evaluate the best access to the donor site. We have to map of incision, followed or not by release incision, depending on the access area available and the amount of the graft required. You can follow how we harvest the bone from tuberosity step by step through this movie. After anesthesia, we should do a posterior anterior crest incision, start in the last part of the tuberosity until the distal part of the last molar. In this case, we have to do a vertical release incision because we intend to remove the wisdom tooth along with the bone graft. And we use a mold elevator to raise a flap we should see the field as much as possible. Before we remove the tooth, here we are using a straight chisel to harvest cortical medullary bone. The chisel is placed perpendicularly to the bone extruder. After two or three millimeters deepening using a surgical hammer, the chisel's angulation is modified according to the desired size and width. And after releasing, a straight force is used to hold the graft. This cortical medullary graft should be used to reconstruct the buccal cortical bone loss. After that, we remove the tooth. Now we are using a gauze shaped chisel to remove bone to be crushed and inserted in the space. We can use this chisel, this chisel in several positions. All bone harvest we insert in a recipient with saline solution. And the suture, we have to do this step after reconstruction. After removal the graft from tuberosity, we reshape the graft in height and width using a rounder to reproduce the shape of the pair implant bone defect. The graft must be tried in after each sequential adjustment according to the shape of the defect area as you can observe through this illustration. The graft is carefully inserted on the defect between the implant and the mucous tissue, being in close contact with the remaining bone walls by just the position, reshaping the socket. The cervical portion of the graft should match with the implant platform. The cortical portion of the graft is oriented to the buccal and the medullary portion to the implant body. It's essential to obtain primary stability of the graft by just the position. Here we are measuring the gap to be filled after insertion the cortical medullar graft. But when the bone graft is left loose behind the soft tissue, we could compromise the result. Then the tighter it's introduced, the better the result is. Before insertion of the graft, you can see here the defect. And after insertion of the cortical medullary graft. Take a look the just position of the graft into the defect. And after insertion the cortical medullary graft, we crush the graft as much as possible using a rounder. This procedure will facilitate the insertion and the condensation of the graft into the gap. Here we are inserting bony particles into the gap. 
and compaction of bone particles using bone compactors between the medullar portion of the cortical medullar graft and the threads of the implant to ensure secondary stabilization of the graft. This condensation is made with bone compactor in the apical coronal direction. We have to take care not to dislocate the cortical medullar graft. For this reason, the bone graft is carefully supported on the buccal direction using a motor elevator. Just checking the reconstruction and the graft position two or three millimeters from the gingival margin. We use this instrument to pack bone graft into the gaps. This instrument is made of titanium. Then we can touch the platform of the implant and the small size are used to pack the bone graft from the apical third of the defect to the medial third and the big size we use from the medial third to the cervical third till to completely fill the gap. The better the condensation, the better the bone remodeling process and less possibility of loss of volume of bone graft. And we should not have empty spaces after compaction to avoid any impaired bone remodeling and loss of bone volume. After bone reconstruction, if we press the periodontal probe in the buccal aspect, the soft tissue doesn't change. We achieve the ideal volume of a new buccal bone wall. Here we can see the wide of the gap and the defect before and after reconstruction. And we can check and confirm the bone reconstructed and maintaining the volume of, of soft tissue in the or original position. This is the last step of the technique. Installation of the screwed provisional crown onto the implant. After crown placement and adaptation, the abutment screw is torqued and the screw access hole is sealed. The final bone graft stabilization is achieved through provisional crown placement with correct emergence profile that will adapt to the surrounding tissues promoting good marginal sealing. Just to call your attention, in this case the provisional crown is shorter than the contralateral tooth to be out of occlusion. Just follow the sequence before, after implant insertion and after bone reconstruction. You can notice total filling of the gaps. Here two weeks later we can see the healing process of soft tissues, better accommodation of gingival margin and maintaining of volume of soft tissue. CBCT 15 days later, the height of the bone reconstructed, just checking the thickness of the bone reconstructed in the day of the surgery, and 15 days later, the 3 mm width of the bone reconstructed. Through this image, we can see the leveling of the gingival margin and papillae and the volume of soft tissue. Here we have the highest myoline evidencing the leveling of the gingival margin. The IDR technique may promote an improvement in the quality of soft tissues with increased the thickness and the stability of perimplant mucosa around prosthetic crown. Comparing the thickness of the soft tissue before and after the IDR procedure. Take a look at the maintenance of the volume of soft tissue. Here we are measuring the thickness of the gingival tissue three months following the procedure to compare it with the initial situation. Remember that we had around half millimeter thick and now we can see around four millimeters thick. This is the instrument that we use for measuring the thickness.
you can see the quality and the thickness of the soft tissue. Here we can notice the great difference in thickness between the new cortical bone at the implant and the cortical bone of the contralateral tooth. By the immediate post-op, we can see the maintenance of the soft tissue volume. We can observe clinically and by CT scan with sagittal and axial sections 3 mm in the reconstructed bone. And we can realize the maintenance of the soft tissue volume and the quality of the perimplantar soft tissue three months later. And we are able to compare the volume of the soft tissue before and after use of the IDR technique. Comparing before and after through these images, we can see the leveling of the gingival margin after the IDR procedure. The requirements for the technique success. Knowledge in surgery, oral implantology, periodontology and prosthetics. Training with the techniques. Minimally invasive dental extraction. Installation of implants in fresh sockets. Harvesting of maxillary tuberosity graft and construction of provisional crown with appropriate emergence profile. And some advantages of this technique. Less morbidity in the surgical procedure, enhanced predictability when compared to traditional flap raising protocols, avoiding tissue shrinkage, maintenance of gingival architecture, gingival margin, and interproximal papillar tissue, less chair time, one session procedure with a reduced final cost, and better patient acceptance. We have had 243 cases which had presented different bone defects in maxilla and mandible. The majority of the cases presented defects involving all buccal bone wall, in almost 60%. Here we are considering just the case performed by our team. This is the book related to the technique that we launched in 2010 in Portuguese language and 2012 in Spanish language and it will be launched in English language very soon. In the last six years, we have used this technique in all cases of compromised extraction sockets with a great success. I hope I have contributed with you. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. See you at the next meeting here in Dental XP.